Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I'm Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. Hey, with the whirlwind of activity that we have been dealing with here in the Second Amendment world over the last few months, we have routinely failed to pay attention to some really, really important appellate cases kicking around this nation, which can significantly influence your Second Amendment rights. One of them is a case out of the Northern District of Texas. We've talked about it once before on this video right here. And that is a case that is designed to stop ATF's grotesque overreach into the world of unfinished frames and receivers. Well, there has been some significant developments in that case, and we want to share them with you today. So today, let's spend a few minutes and talk about how ATF is losing every step of the way on unfinished frames and receivers. Okay, before we get going down the road, we are going down. Proud to announce that this video is being brought to you by Security Gun Club. That's right. Washington's nicest indoor shooting facility is found right there in Woodville, Washington Security Gun Club. Now, you've heard me talk about them before. Yes, I brag about their staff because they do have absolutely the best staff in the business. Yes, I brag about the facility because it is the nicest facility you will find in the business. And yes, I do brag frequently about Jackson, the head of training over there, because I do believe that Security Gun Club has developed absolutely Absolutely the best curriculum in the business. However, this weekend, Security Gun Club is celebrating their third birthday. That's right, they've been in business for three years. So why don't you stop on by this weekend at Security Gun Club in Woodenville, right at this location here, and pay them a visit, check out the facility, and sign up today. And listen, if you're there on Saturday or Sunday, make sure you stop by and say hi to yours truly. So for more information, visit my good friends at securitygunclub.com. That is not a misprint. That is how they spell it, securitygunclub.com. Okay, so the case that we're talking about today, and we have talked about it previously before on this video here, is the case of Vanderstock v. Garland, filed in the Northern District of Texas District Court, United States District Court, there in Fort Worth. And this is a lawsuit which is brought, obviously, by Miss Vanderstock, Tactical Machining, a company that was manufacturing these, and then, of course, spearheaded by our good friends, yes, your favorite plaintiffs and mine, the Firearms Policy Coalition. And again, like usual, I'm going to put a link for the Firearms Policy Coalition down below. So if you guys want to show them some love, they are in the trenches all the time fighting for your rights. You'll have the ability to do so. Now, as we know, this suit was filed. And so we got Vanderstock, we got Tactical Machining, and we got the Firearms Policy Coalition. Now, one of the things that happened was Tactical Machining moved for a temporary injunction, which is we don't want this law enforced upon us because... It's going to cause us irreparable harm, and we believe we have a good claim. And as we know, the court actually, in this video right here, we talked about it, the court granted that temporary injunction. Well, enter the Blackhawk Manufacturing Group, a company doing business as 80% arms. Some of you may be familiar with them. Well, Blackhawk Manufacturing Group had written a declaration in support of Tactical Machining's complaint, but then they went one step further and said, hey, no, actually, we want in on this lawsuit. We want to be a named plaintiff also. So they asked to join the suit. Now, of course, the United States government immediately flipped out and did everything in the world to block them from becoming a plaintiff to this suit. But the court ruled in Blackhawk Manufacturing Group's favor and allowed them to enter into the suit. OK, that's the first good development. So now there is one more named plaintiff. Now, this group, which is doing this new plaintiff, which is doing business under 80% arms, I think we can all figure out what it is they are selling. That's right. What are they manufacturing? What are they selling? That's right. They're, se they're manufacturing and selling 80% lowers. So after they were added to this suit, they too then went to the court and said, hey, we want the same injunction that Tactical Machining got. Because Tactical Machining got an injunction that allows them to continue to manufacture and sell these products. And they got an injunction that protects all of tactical man uh, machining's customers, okay? We want the same thing. And of course, the United States government threw a fit and objected vehemently to Black, Black Hawk Manufacturing Group, or 80% Arms, getting a temporary injunction. The court has now ruled on that. And so, hot off the presses, I am proud to announce that the Blackhawk Manufacturing Group, the new plaintiff to Vanderstock v. Garland, has also been granted the temporary injunction. Now, what does an injunction do? An injunction basically is a pause button. It tells 
the losing side, hey, you have to pause what you're doing. You cannot continue what to, what you're doing until we, the court, decide the legality of what you are trying to do here. So in this case, the United States government is stopped from enforcing ATF's new rules on frames and unfinished receivers against both tactical machining and now against the Blackhawk Manufacturing Group. Now, in granting the temporary injunction for Blackhawk Manufacturing, the court very succinctly pointed out the issue of this litigation to be as follows. Plaintiffs brought this suit to challenge the legality of the final rule and claim, among other things, that the regulation exceeds the statutory authority that Congress vested in the ATF. Yeah, really, do you think? And then the court wisely points out, within a week of filing their complaint on October 17, 2022, the plaintiffs moved for a preliminary injunction seeking to broadly enjoin the government from enforcing its final rule. On September 2nd, 2022, the court issued its first opinion in which it found that the provisions of ATF's rule, specifically 27 CFR sections 478.11 and 478.12C, likely exceed the scope of ATF's authority under the Gun Control Act. Having made this preliminary finding, the court enjoined the defendants, including the Attorney General, Department of Justice, ATF, and the ATF Director, along with their officers, agents, servants, and employees from implementing or enforcing this rule against only tactical machining, but otherwise denying injunctive release to the remaining plaintiffs. And, and you see, what the plaintiffs had originally argued is, hey, listen, the people who are suffering irreparable harm is everybody who happens to be a member of the Firearms Policy Coalition. Now, the court was not convinced on that. They said, no, listen, as it relates to tactical machining, you, we can absolutely positively identify the irreparable harm, namely you're putting them out of business. You could not demonstrate that to every member of the Firearms Policy Coalition. The court further stated, in its second opinion on the proper scope of the preliminary injunction issued October 1st, 2022, the court extended the injunction to the individual plaintiffs and for the purpose of providing tactical machining complete relief to Tactical's customers. Intervenor plaintiff, Blackhawk Manufacturing Group, doing business as 80% arms, a manufacturer and retailer who sells products subject to ATF's final rule, was permitted to intervene in the suit under the court's order issued October 18, 2022, and now seeks its own protective preliminary injunction. Blackhawk seeks a preliminary injunction that mirrors the relief currently afforded to tactical machining. Blackhawk's request for injunctive relief rests on its claims that the final rule was issued in excess of ATF's statutory authority, is facially unlawful, and unlawfully purports to regulate weapons, parts, kits as firearms, contrary to the structure of the Gun Control Act. Okay, now the court has granted the temporary injunction for Blackhawk Manufacturing doing business as 80% arms. And everyone goes, okay, big deal, great. That affects them and their customers. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is, is one of the things we do here at Washington Gun Law, and one of the things that a lot of people do out here in the YouTubeiverse is try to read the tea leaves, read between the lines, figure out what is this likely telling us about what is the ultimate outcome of, of this case gonna be. And in this case, when we see not once, but twice, a party ask for temporary injunctive relief and get it granted. This is a very encouraging sign. Why is that? Well, it's because what you have to show in order to get an injunction granted is very similar to what you got to show to prevail on the merits of the case. The case law on obtaining temporary injunctive relief specifically states to establish entitlement to preliminary injunction, Blackhawk must demonstrate one, a substantial likelihood of success on the merits. Two, a substantial threat of irreparable harm. Three, that the balance of hardships weighs in its favor. And four, that the issuance of the preliminary injunction will not deserve the public interest. Okay, and it's really this first one right here. A substantial likelihood of success on the merits. That is, in fact, the most encouraging thing. But what the court is saying is, is we have analyzed the arguments of both sides, and we believe the plaintiff's argument is the correct argument as we review it today. And then just for your own geeking out edification, factors number three and four actually merge into one factor if it is the government which is opposing the temporary injunction, which obviously was the case here. But the most encouraging thing, again, is from that very first factor demonstrating that the plaintiff has shown that they're likely to prevail on the merits. 
And listen, the court went on to justify and explain its reasoning under this criteria as follows. As Blackhawk correctly points out, this court has already preliminarily determined that the original plaintiff's statutory interpretation claims are likely to prevail on the merits. Blackhawk raises nearly identical interpretive claims that the final rule was issued in excess of ATF statutory authority under the APA is facially unlawful and contravenes the Gun Control Act's clear statutory prescriptions in its complaint. And so what the court's saying here is, listen, they've come at this at three ways, and we right now in our preliminary review of the arguments believe that all three of these claims are valid claims. The court further stated, to summarize, the final rule purports to regulate firearms parts, including incomplete, non-functional receivers and weapon part kits, contrary to the plain language of the GCA, which confined ATF's authority to regulations of firearms, a term clearly defined by the statute. Moreover, the final rules expanded definition of frame or receiver to include partially manufactured non-functional receivers within the meaning of firearms, contrary to the Gun Control Act's clear statutory definition, is facially unlawful. Now, the United States government made a few other disingenuous arguments, including that, hey, Black Hawk didn't hop in on this thing right away, so therefore they can't really have irreparable harm. The court was none bit too persuaded, pointing out that they had been participating in this lawsuit from the moment it was filed and only later on changed to intervener. And of course, once they were allowed to intervene as a plaintiff, the remedies that they sought would be identical to that of tactical machining. That's the exact reason for which they were allowed to intervene in the suit. So the bottom line is, I know many of you are concerned about the ATF's new broadened definitions and regulations of unfinished frames and receivers. We've done a bunch of videos on that, trying to get you all to understand what that really means to you. However, Vanderstock v. Garland is a case that is not only established in very good case law, but it is a case that is beginning to pick up steam. And so far, the ATF has been losing every step of the way. We will put links for that case down below. And obviously, if you want to help out any of the named plaintiffs, if you want to make contributions to the FFLs that are sticking their necks out on this thing, if you want to help out the good folks at the Firearms Policy Coalition, we will put links for all of that down below so you can do that. In the meantime, if you have any questions about this suit or anything else related to your Second Amendment rights, remember, you can always contact us at WashingtonGunLaw.com, or of course you can call us directly at 425-765-0487. Now, let's remember, part of being a lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here at Washington Gun Laws, to know what the law is in every situation and how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching, and stay safe.